Good afternoon. My name is JJ Spoon and I'm a professor of political science and director of the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to this month's conversation on Europe, which is part of our Year of Creating Europe series. Today's topic is the Scandinavian or Nordic model, social, social cohesion, cultural diversity, and trust in institutions in Northern Europe. Today's event is the fourth of several virtual roundtables that explore what diversity means in Europe from different perspectives and the differences in approaches to creating a sense of common European identity throughout Europe. You will have the opportunity to ask questions using the chat or the Q&A function. Feel free to pose questions at any time during the discussion and I will try to get to as many of these as I can. Today's conversation is sponsored by the European Studies Center, the University Center of International Studies at at Pittsburgh. It is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. Our co-sponsors are the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at Florida International University, the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Florida. To learn more about our future conversations on Europe and programming we are doing with other EU-funded institutions in the US through the JM in the USA initiative, please visit our website. And one of my colleagues will put that in the chat. I want to thank Iris Matijevich and Kenny Riley for their help with today's event. The countries of Northern Europe have long been identified by a set of policies and programs set up in the 1930s, often referred to as the Nordic or Scandinavian model, which emphasizes a mixed economy, comprehensive welfare state, and collective responsibility. All citizens enjoy high quality social services, which typically include free education and health care, as well as generous pensions for retirees. The Nordic countries have comparatively low levels of income inequality. They rank highly on the United Nations Human Development Index and gender equality and have very low levels of corruption, according to Transparency International. Citizens have high levels of trust in each other and of institutions and are generally satisfied with their lives. But this model is being challenged by the rise of far-right populist parties and increasing immigration, which raises the question of if and how the model can survive. Moreover, what can we learn from the Nordic model and can it travel to other countries? To help us to better understand the Nordic model, its implications and challenges, I'm joined today by a panel of experts. First, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Greta Brockman, who is professor in the Department of Sociology and Human Geography at the University of Oslo in Norway. Her research focuses on comparative integration and immigration policies in welfare states and in the Nordic region. She has published several books and many articles on international migration, welfare state dilemmas, and historical studies on welfare policy and immigration. Her publications include Immigration Policy and the Scandinavian Welfare State, 1945 to 2010, and Europe's Immigration Challenge, Reconciling Work, Welfare, and Mobility. Dr. Brockman has been head of two national commissions on immigration and sustainability of the Norwegian welfare model. She has held various positions in the Norwegian Research Council and is member of the Norwegian Academy of Science. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Christian Albrecht Larsen, who is professor in the Center for Comparative Welfare Studies and Department of Politics and Society at Aalborg University in Denmark. His work focuses on the question of how to build socially coherent societies in open economies and multicultural settings. In particular, he looks at how institutions, especially universal welfare schemes, enhance public support for anti-poverty policies and social trust. Among his publications are The Rise and Fall of Social Cohesion, Constructing and Deconstructing Social Trust in the US, UK, Sweden, and Denmark, and the recently published co-authored book, Migrants, Attitudes, and the Welfare State, The Danish Melting Pot. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Frank Martella, who is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management at Aalto University in Finland. His research focuses on trust and happiness in Finland and other Nordic countries. His most recent publication is A Wonderful Life, Insights on Finding a Meaningful Existence. He is also chairman of the board of the consulting and research firm Academy of Philosophy, which focuses on measuring engagement, motivation, and meaningfulness at work and working with organizations on how to improve work life. Finally, um, I'm pleased to welcome my colleague, B. Guy Peters, who is Morris Falk Professor of American Government in the Department of Political Science at the University of Pittsburgh. He has written extensively in the areas of public administration and public policy, both in the US and comparatively. His most recent publications inc include policy problems and policy design, 
and the fourth edition of Institutional Theory and Political Science. He is the founding president of the International Public Policy Association and is currently the editor of, International, of the International Review of Public Policy. Welcome to everyone and thank you all for being here. Uh, some of you, it's already early evening, um, so thank you. Um, and I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Um, I thought I would start out with something that um, I mentioned briefly in the introduction, which is uh, a bit more about what the Scandinavian or Nordic model is for those in our audience who may be less familiar with it, um, as well as if there are differences across countries um, and where and why it was developed. In other words, just a bit more on, on the background. Uh, Guy, I wonder if you could start uh, on, with us on that. Sure, as the non-Scandinavian on the panel. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think you know, we can talk about the Scandinavian model having at least five components just to try to sort of do this somewhat systematically. The first is JJ has already mentioned is high trust. So interpersonal as well as the trust of government. So it's a, there are societies in which people trust one another and they generally trust their government, although the latter is declining, according to the surveys. But with that trust also goes a lot of accountability. So inventing institutions like the ombudsperson as means of controlling the government along as well as having trust in it. Secondly, the systems are participatory um, with high levels of, of participation, both in elections but also through mechanisms that Stain Rock and call corporate pluralism, where you have interest groups and their involvement with government as a second pillar of democracy. Thirdly, they tend to be consensual with a larger part of bargaining, negotiation, trying to come up with some sort of consensus solutions and having enduring policy commitments. So they very much fit the model that Aaron Leifart talked about as consensual democracies. Uh, fourthly, uh, they're decentralized, relatively speaking. So even though they're all unitary states, they are, have a strong local governments, a long history of communal liberty. And within government, particularly for Sweden, uh, the, the executive branch itself is decentralized and has been for centuries with agencies having a reasonable amount of autonomy from the central government. Uh, from the, excuse me, from the, I should say from the ministries. So even though they're unitary, seemingly centralized, in practice, they're, they're reasonably decentralized. And finally, as JJ mentioned at the beginning, they're probably most known for a strong and generous and, and inclusive welfare state. So when most people think about the Scandinavian model, the Nordic model, the first thing that comes to mind would be the welfare state. Great, thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a nice kind of, I think, overview of, of, um, of the model more generally. Christian, I wonder if you might want, uh, jump in on that and maybe give some insight into more than uh, what I mentioned in the, in, in the introduction of sort of where these, where, this, where these come from and perhaps some sense of if they're the variants that we might see across, across the different countries as well. Yeah, so I think it's yeah. I think uh, Guy gave a very good overview to some sort of the organizational structure of it. I, I think I will start by saying that sometimes it is whatever is present in the Nordic countries that is called the Nordic model. So there is some kind of sometimes we do it a little inductively, uh, and there's also a social constructive side to the modeling of calling it a model. There's a lot, there's a history about that. So, but. But if you go to the facts, then what is the common denominator? Uh, I think what, what Guy just mentioned is, is, is um, there's definitely something about the state, 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 the state capacity, how is it organized. Um, my main interest in how we organized the, the welfare state was this sort of the, the, the most known brand. And I think this, this thing of universalism comes to mind that it is heavily tax financed. So it's not done by insurance and, and it's done by, by general taxes and it gives uh, on a citizenship uh, basis. So it's not only to those who are insured or those who are poor, but actually, as you mentioned in the 30s, it turns into national insurances for, the, for all citizens with the same need. 
so you have this idea of some kind of universalism and then the university come two different branches like 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 the 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 the, the, the uk where they tried after second world war that was sort of a, a very low level universalism and, and what the nordic country tried at least for some time that was what you call a Royal, Rolls royce universalism where you have a decent level uh, for pensions for Healthcare for a lot of uh, things uh, that is at at the standard that the middle classes and upper middle classes they would they would uh, accept it and there's a lot of it. there's then there are many dynamics when you have this kind of broad uh, people insurance um, so so for me this is part of it and and it's also I I, I very much go with Jesper Esping Anderson another of uh, our old colleagues saying that. This come in a package with a labor market structure, and it also come comes with a with a package uh, with a labor uh, with a, a family structure. So it's some time some somehow this embedded institutional structures that is called the Nordic model, uh, and it it comes yeah if you have been traveling it comes in this kind of a package uh, that is somehow interlinked. I think that's one way of understanding it. Mm -hmm. Greta. Yeah, no, I agree fully with, with uh, all that has been said so far, but there are a couple of, of more uh, elements that, that I find extremely important. I mean, the dynamics between the labor market structure, the regulated labor market and the welfare institutions is extremely uh, important. And what has characterized all the Scandinavian countries for years now um, is the fact that it, it's a very compressed wage structure compared to, to other uh, models and other, other um, welfare states, uh, which means that even um, low-skilled work is, is, relatively speaking, uh, highly paid, which in, in, in the context of, of um, immigration is extremely important. And also the fact, which is part of this universalistic approach, um, that you have access to basic income security from day one, if you are a legal immigrant, that is extremely important also. And it's very different from the more insurance-based welfare models that you find further south in, in Europe, for instance. So these features I would like to add on top of what, what um, Christian and, and Guy have said so far. Great, thank you. Guy, did you, sorry, I didn't know. I, I, sorry, I, I didn't know if I saw your hand there. <laughs> no, no, you may have, but it wasn't on purpose. Okay. <laughs> Um, so um, thank you. I think this gives us, you know, a, a nice overview of of the, the the Nordic or Scandinavian model as we see it. Um, so I wonder if if anyone wants to kind of take a, a moment just to to give us a bit of a sense of where these came, this idea came from, and sort of its evolution. I mean, I, as I said, I, you know, at the beginning, of course, this came in developed in the 1930s, largely by social democratic parties. Um, in Sweden and elsewhere. Um, but if anyone wants to kind of give a bit of a historical perspective on kind of the idea of where this kind of came from and how it's developed um, over, the, over the, the last 90 years, I suppose, or so. Anyone would like to take that one? It's a tough one in two minutes. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, again, just to, you but, know, yeah, it's, <laughs> of course, <laughs> we could spend hours talking about it. Yeah, I, I, I can start out on, on on the welfare sort of institutional side. I think sometimes when we we like to tell the story that it was by chance that there was some kind of unforeseen luck to it, that 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 you start to build some some tax finance structures, uh, partly in in opposition to Germany, who who had this insurance uh, system, and it wasn't like thought through that that we are going to build us into a universal welfare state. It was more like this was the track that we came on, and then there was political political fights along the way, which which ended up there. But but there's also a deeper historical side to it. I think Guy is better at, at telling that than 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 me about a fairly uh, universal state structure that was uh, uncorrupt and which sort of uh, created a foundation for giving states these kind of responsibilities for everything what one could say or at least <laughs> a lot of a lot of, uh, of things that could be organized by the states and and not by uh, social partners or, or families mm -hmm. okay thank you guy oh i think you know christian is, is quite right what he said but i think as he also said Excuse me, there are some deeper roots. Again, you know, I think Boo Rushteen talks about this very well, particularly for Sweden, in terms of the interaction of, of, of essentially 
re responsible, benevolent institutions and a responsible, benevolent society. So they essentially, they worked in almost in a virtuous circle to build the, the, the state and to build a welfare state. But I mean, but interestingly, I mean, you know, if we want to go back almost into prehistory, I mean, there are arguments then about you know, how the culture of trust, how the culture of cooperation would begin. I mean, I, just, I remember you know, this is ancient history, but you know, Terry Eckstein, his book on Norway in the 1960s, arguing that essentially this you know, mutual dependence ideas came really from living in small communities where people had to get along. And so they learned and then were able to transfer that. Now that may be, you know, you know, a fairy tale, but it's a nice fairy tale. And it says a lot about you know, to some extent how cultures develop. You know, it may be accident, but it's also sometimes out of necessity. No, thank you. And I think and we'll get back to, to some of some of those those points in a bit. Uh, Greta, did you yeah, wanna but there, there is one extremely important point to, to add before we move on, and that is the word class compromise. That was instituted in the 30s in, in uh, Scandinavia, and it was essential for uh, the later development of the welfare state institutions. And that uh, it was sort of a, a compromise also uh, re <clears throat> reinforcing and creating a kind of trust that was not there uh, to a large extent beforehand. So, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's uh, what happened before the Second World War uh, was sort of creating a basis for what happened afterwards, because the, the major development of the, the, the welfare state institutions, as we know them today, took place after Second World War. But what happened during the 30s was, was extremely important with the labor movement um, being tamed, sort of, um, and, and uh, the compromise that came out of this, this, um, uh, these developments with very, very strong and heavy class conflicts uh, during the late uh, 20s and the early 30s. And, and then a sort of a mitigation of, of, uh, of that situation, which again made the foundation for, for a, a much more um, low key peaceful kind of institutional development uh, afterwards but also i would like to add that this what christian said implicitly at least uh, about incremental change is also extremely important because one of the major features of the scandinavian welfare model has been its its uh, ability to adapt and and um, adjust uh, to changes it's, it's not the kind of um, a, a fixed uh, fixed model that is is um, uh, that is uh, in a stable sense um, functioning in a specific way. I mean, to a certain extent, that is the case, but it's also changing, and uh, particularly now that over the last uh, twenty years, and maybe particularly in Denmark. Uh, very important uh, institutional and, and structural changes uh, to the system has taken place. I mean, uh, like fin yeah. Finnish experience because, like, the Finland, the development was also like quite dramatic in like the beginning of the 20th century because Finland was like part of the Russian Empire until like 1917. Then during the World War, First World War, Finland, Finland got its independence from the Russia because they were like too occupied with themselves, like fighting their own civil war. So Finland became independent, but then there was like this like this power vacuum in Finland. There wasn't like no army or anything. So there, there was like the civil war within the Finland. So like kind of like the, the working class like rebelled against like the, the ruling class and there was a civil war, but like, and it, it lasted for like several months and, after, after, and the kind of like the working class lost, lost a social democratic party and th these people, they lost, lost the war. But then the next elections already like, in, like just like half a year later, there was like three elections where the Social Democratic Party was like part of the election and they got like quite a big part of the parliament. And in a few years, they had like already, many of the like the goals that they had with the civil war, they had like achieved those through the parliamentary way. Like you know, for example, there was a big land reform where like people got like much more land. There was like this working laws were changed more, more towards like more humane ways, like minimal working or maximum working hours and minimal wages and so forth. And then when, when the Second World War came and the, the Russia or the Soviet Union was like attacking Finland, 
And their idea was that they, they, if they attack Finland, the working class will like join them. So the Finnish people are so divided that the kind of like the working class who had lost this war 20 years earlier, they will decide this moment and like join the Russian forces to make, make sure that Finland is, becomes part of this communist country. But the kind of like the working class have gained so much in, the, in these 20 years that actually they, they were like pointing, that, that, that was the moment when Finnish people felt that they were like united was like the moment when, they, when everybody was fighting against the Russian or R Russian invasion in the Second World War. So during those 20 years between 1917, 1917 and 1939, a big change had ch taken place within the Finland and that as regards to social cohesion and, all this, <laughs> and this class, kind of like this class compromise that, that Greta was talking about. Great, thank you for, for that perspective. Um, I want to... Um, move on a bit and talk about, um, well, there's so many things to talk about, but I want to talk um, about some of the um, some of the challenges that um, I think we've kind of a, a alluded to a bit and, and something, going back to what Greta said, something about sort of this idea of the need to, to adapt and evolve um, in terms of thinking about sort of the, it, all of these various policies and programs and things that, that, that you all have been talking about. Um, and so one of those challenges, as we know, has been um, that by um, that of increasing immigration. And Greta, I wonder if you could could talk us um, start us off by talking a bit about um, how um, the Nordic model and many of these things we've been talking about have been challenged as, as we're seeing um, immigration increase in many in many of the Nordic countries in the past uh, couple of decades. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... Yeah, immigration is, is one of the challenges only. Uh, it's not the challenge, uh, in, as far as I'm concerned, but it is the challenge that gets most uh, attention uh, in the public. And, and maybe also it, it has got uh, more and more attention because of the, of the um, uh, populist um, response many places in, in, in Europe. But um, in the, in the Scandinavian uh, countries, a, the, the aging of the population is, financially speaking, a much larger um, challenge. But that is not to say that immigration is not uh, a challenge also, but it depends on what we're talking about, which is always important when you're saying the word immigration, because immigration has both desirable and more problematic effects when, when it's considered from a welfare uh, state perspective. And the, the consequences of migration for uh, the development and the sustainability of the, the welfare model depend on um, the, the type of uh, new um, arrivals, uh, the resources that they bring uh, with them, what kind of qualifications they have, uh, and, and very importantly also the, the extent to which they are integrated into um, most importantly, the labor market, but also society at large. So all these variables are extremely important when we are sort of overall um, estimating whether immigration is uh, a good or a problematic thing for the sustainability of the welfare state. And, and um, typically today, in, it, there is variation also in, in, within Scandinavia when it comes to the, the scope and, and also to a certain extent the, 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 um, um, the types of immigrants that dominate, um, which is also extremely important for the reasons that I just uh, mentioned. Uh, but we have uh, Norway, for instance, have um, a, has had the highest in, in, in the Nordic uh, area, the highest uh, number of um, uh, labor migrants or uh, EU migrants in, in particular uh, since 2004 and 2007 when, when the EU extended eastward. Uh, Sweden has had uh, the largest share of uh, humanitarian um, uh, so-called humanitarian immigrants, I mean, refugees, asylum seekers, and, and family migrants, uh, <clears throat> which, of course, uh, constitutes a very, very different setup in, in economic terms and in institutional terms for, for the, the different governments. Denmark has been sort of a country in the middle when it comes to this uh, composition of uh, immigrants into the, the, the states. Um, so Sweden has, in so many ways, uh, had the greatest challenges because they have got the kind of immigrants that are more difficult to integrate into the skill demanding 
labor market that you have in all the Scandinavian countries, whereas Norway has had an easier task with all the EU migrants coming in because they are demand driven. So they are per definition employed the, the very moment that they, they, uh, they uh, enter the country, more or less, more or less. So it's, it's a very, very different setting in, in Sweden as compared to, to Norway and then Denmark sort of uh, in, in the middle in, in, in this, this uh, respect. But um, in all three countries, it, it is a challenge because the, the number of, um, of uh, low-skilled immigrants um, uh, has been quite high, and then particularly high in, in, in Sweden. And it is demanding in this, uh, with this compressed wage structure, as I, I mentioned, to include people with very low qualifications because um, the low productivity uh, makes it difficult to, 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 um, for, for employers to justify the high salaries. Uh, and and uh, because of the very regulated labor market, it, it's still very regulated compared to, to other places, although it, it has gone down uh, sort of over the decades. Uh, we, this means that it's, uh, it's a tendency, particularly with the extremely low uh, skilled immigrants, that they depend on the welfare state for uh, many years. I mean, some people never get absorbed in the, the labor market at all. Uh, and this is worrying um, uh, very much so in, in all three countries, although it's discussed differently uh, in, in the, the different publics, the public spheres in three, three, four countries. Thank you. I think that was, that was a really, really great, uh, really interesting overview. And I appreciate you thinking, getting us to think beyond kind of this, the country's in sort of one lump sum, right? That there are very important differences, um, as you point out, in who is migrating and what that looks like in the various countries and how that, um, and, and the different re responses that that has led to. So, so thank you. Um, Christian, I wanna turn to, to you to talk a bit about, first of all, this idea of welfare nationalism that, um, that you've written quite a bit about and also how um, increasing immigration of perhaps both on the demand and the supply side, depending on what that looks like in different countries, might um, have changed sort of attitudes towards welfare nationalism in, in some of the Scandinavian Nordic countries. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's a very, um, let's call it, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a it, so, so by welfare nationalism, it is more or less that the welfare state should be for our kind of people. And I think it is, it is or our, uh, and I think that it's it's very deep. So the welfare state is is built into nation states, and nation states they they tend to think of themselves as belonging to a nation, and therefore it's it's not a very strange idea that people they think that those should who should be entitled are those who belong to the nation, right? So this is that's why I call it the welfare nationalism and not chauvinism, which is more negatively. But the basic idea is that we should have. Welfare services and benefits that has been developed that they should be somehow be restricted to those who belong to the nation or, or, or the natives or whatever we call it. So, so this is the this is the political discussion that is going on. Uh, who, who should be entitled and who should not? And should migrant be um, uh, entitled? And when should they be entitled? Uh, that that is the, the big discussion. And I think it's, it, it comes down to when we enter the European Union and we, we had these discussions in in the seventies. In, in, in Norway, uh, by, by, by the Progress Party and also in Denmark, they say well, we should restrict uh, our, uh, our welfare state to, to our own. So, so this is the basic idea. And if you look at attitudes, uh, basically people, they, they have this tendency to think of this. So if you, if, if you ask who should be entitled and you put a, a migrant into the setting in experimental stuff or just by asking people, they will tend to say that it should be for Norwegians and, and Danes or, or whatsoever. But then there are all kind of dimensions into this because people they still think that at some point in time they should be included and 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 the standard argument is that after a time after you have paid your taxes or or work then you should somehow be entitled. Uh, so there are very few who say that they should never be entitled and there's also very few saying that they should be immediately entitled. So it is, it is about finding this balance uh, between what kind of rules should through which kind of rules should be entitled. And, and people, they had different opinions to that. 
and and there are we don't have very good data, but but there are some data showing that. I, 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 I put forward an article showing that people that actually tend to think that rules should be as they are in Scandinavia. So even though we have a big discussion on it, when, if you ask people how should they look, for instance, in, 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 in pension or in healthcare, people, they tend to say, but let's keep the rules as they are, <laughs> which is a good thing because there are this built-in conservatism into, into Scandinavia. And we think we have a pretty good system that is working and therefore people, they tend to want to keep things as they are, even the entitlement of migrants, even though it is discussed uh, a couple of times. But there's also another side too, that, that is people, they tend to think that it's easier, uh, the migrants should easy, have easier entitlement to services than to benefits. And uh, I'm, you, you, can, you can come up with different arguments about that. It could be something about the, 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 the risk that they're covering. So most people also in Scandinavia would say that immediately access to healthcare that should be given, uh, access to schools, actually access to childcare on day one. Whereas when it comes to social assistance and especially taking child allowances to people, to children living outside of Denmark or Norway and Sweden, then public opinion, they become very uh, different. So it's also comes, it's not an either or, people, they are pretty sensitive towards what kind of services and benefits are we actually talking about. Mm -hmm. It was a long answer, but but uh, yeah, uh, that's what I think. I, I think we know at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No, that's 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 really interesting. Yes, Greta. Yeah, no, uh, no, I, I I fully agree with what uh, Christian says. Uh, uh, but but one thing is, I mean, public attitudes. Another thing is what is possible to do institutionally. And uh, as, as we have already talked about, I mean, there, there are some systemic necessities, so to speak, in the Scandinavian welfare labor market model, which is, is, is difficult to, to um, get around uh, without uh, disturbing the uh, institutional balance, which is extremely important for the sustenance of the, the, the model itself. And that means, um, the dynamics, as I mentioned, between the, the labor market, the regulated labor market, and uh, the welfare institutions. I mean, if you if you uh, try to um, exclude newcomers from uh, income security, from the basic um, basic uh, welfare institutions, apart from the services, then you risk to having a sort of a, a, a second tire within the labor market, which can serve as a, 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 um, a social dumping uh, mechanism, which is extremely um, uh, harmful to how the whole system is, is um, constructed in the first place. Because then if, if you start dumping the salaries, then you will also over the years uh, put a pressure on the compensation level of the, the welfare benefits. And this tends to become a negative spiral that can undermine these institutional balance between the labor market and the welfare system. So what, what has been going on in Denmark has been extremely interesting because I mean, probably most, most uh, people in the audience is, is not familiar with the Danish reforms to the welfare system since the turn of the century. Denmark was, was the first Scandinavian country to start introducing um, a differentiated uh, compensation level uh, according to um, uh, how many years of, of uh, uh, residency uh, one person, a person would, would have, which was a sort of a, a measure not to discriminate against immigrants, although the, the measure was uh, aimed at, definitely aimed at immigrants. But at the same time, there was sort of an equal treatment um, measure to it because Danes that had um, emigrated would sort under the same rules. So they, they have, uh, they, they have uh, the, the, the cover uh, from a, a um, human rights uh, perspective. But this has, has really started a very, very different logic 
from what used to be the case in Scandinavia, where equal treatment was, was really the baseline. But now Denmark started out, Norway is now copying this uh, policy. They, they started uh, in 2015 and now um, more and more measures are included in this differentiated approach. And, and what that will mean for the welfare institutional setup for the years to come is going to be highly uh, interesting and extremely important. And, and um, you, you already now in Denmark, after, after now 20 years of this new approach, you, you see the contours of a, a, uh, a new layered uh, situation within the, the, the Danish um, labor market, but also in, in the social stratification system, more, more generally speaking, that the, the in, there is increased poverty as, as a result of this new approach. And, and inequality is really poison to the uh, logic of the Scandinavian welfare model. So this, this, is, this is really a new um, way of dealing with this extremely important balance that has been there from the very beginning. Great, thank you. Um, actually, we have a question that just popped up that um, I think is very relevant to what we've just been talking about, um, which is, um, and I'll just read it uh, so that everyone can, uh, can, can hear where the question is, which is, do you think that the example of a resulting feedback loop for downward wages is a result of artificially boosted wages? Um, do you think that the problem you mentioned is a result of artificial and sustainable wages from a market perspective? I, I, I didn't get that. So I think, so the question is about um, the example of the feedback loop for downward yeah, wages. Yeah. Um, if it's a result of artificially boosted wages yeah. or artificially high wages, yeah. Um, yeah. And, then I, and then sort of relatedly, if the problem is a result of this artificial and unsustainable wages from a market perspective. Yeah, but the thing is that in, in Scandinavia, we don't have a, a pure market system the way that the, it's not pure in the US either but I mean it, it's it's more a clear-cut market system in the US mm -hmm. so I mean these artificially high uh, salaries is, is not a term that is very uh, applicable in the same uh, sense in, in the Scandinavian setting because I mean it, this this is a the, the wage level has been established through negotiations over the years, and it has been established according to the productivity level that has been there. So the problem is when large new groups arrive without that same kind of productivity level. So then it's, it's, it's not artificial, but um, when, when people are coming in from a completely different market setting, this this uh, imposes uh, a huge challenge to the system and, and of course, also to the, 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 the economy over a longer time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Guy, did you want to jump I, in? I think Christian was there first. But oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. You go ahead. No, okay. I was just you know, wondering, you know, with, with what Greta is saying, if <clears throat> in an increasingly globalized economies, whether in fact those wages levels can be sustained. You know, whether the competition you know, may, may be negotiated within the Scandinavian countries, but they're now a part of the European Union, most of them, and, they, and we all live in a highly globalized economy. So I think perhaps maintaining their wage rates may become increasingly artificial. Christian. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say maybe the same thing as uh, Greta, that they that they are not they are not completely artificial. That okay, they are negotiated, but they are negotiated to productivity. That's sort of the economic side of it. But I also think that if we try to, there have been some of the PISA adult survey measuring skills levels across countries, and it shows that the lowest skill, the lowest levels in Denmark, they are better skilled than, for instance, in the U.S. So to some extent, it is not. They, it, it does not, the wage level is not automatically and they're not artificial. It takes a lot of education uh, to actually maintain those uh, wage levels. So, so you'll find a lot of uh, extra education 
uh, publicly financed and you'll find an, a lot of even though those who who seemed like unskilled they they are typically have a lot of courses uh, where they can actually develop and they they reach higher skills so therefore i i agree with creator that the problem with some of the humanitarian migration is that they enter into a labor market with a high productivity and that is part of the problem or it is part of the it is the problem <laughs> to some extent and uh, yeah and then as for migration, it, 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 then we have two opportunities that we can uh, finance it as we used to do this to secure those who cannot live at the labor market. That, that, that is what has been done. And then what is the Danish way now, as Greta is saying, that then we start to say, OK, we will not do this anymore. The public opinion say, and then we create a new problem that is poverty. Uh, so it's like, um, yeah, what, what we want to do. <laughs> uh, and this is part of the also in terms of legitimacy and some of this. It's a lot of American literature, and you probably know better than me on attitudes to blacks and receiving welfare. But we have a little bit of the same dynamics coming in that this might be possible to finance those who cannot deal or, or, or get by at the labor market if they are natives. But, but what if they are migrants and what if they had just arrived uh, recently? And uh, what if it is the whole family that is uh, depending on the Danish welfare state in this uh, way? Then you start to have these legitimacy problems. Um, which is severe, but I also agree with Greta. Then, uh, but then we create poverty if we don't do it. But then, and then we start to create some of the old problems, social problems that we thought we have solved, and that is also part of the problem definition among ma many uh, Scandinavians. It's not because maybe they don't like migrants, but they don't like the problems that migration uh, cause <laughs> on a societal level. In, in my point of view. Mm -hmm. So I want to, um, th th that's a, a nice segue to, to the next point that I wanted to, to discuss. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, as we think about challenges um, to the, to the, to the, the, the Scandinavian or Nordic model that we've been talking about. Obviously, we spent a lot of time talking about immigration, the aging society, of course, part of that and connected in various ways. But the other challenge that I want to, I want to bring up uh, explicitly is the, is the rise um, in support of the far right. Um, that we're seeing across across the region, and the the and many of the voters that, as we know, that are drawn to parties like the Sweden Democrats, the True Finns, the Progress Party, etc., are those that um, going back to what to a point Christian made earlier, but those that really are, are sort of the welfare nationalists, right? That see that they're that all of these things that we've been talking about should only be um, available to, to specific individuals um, and perhaps not those that are coming in depending on, on, on who those migrants um, themselves may be. Um, and so I wonder, um, perhaps Guy, if you want to maybe start to, to, to talking a bit about, about this and this relationship between the sort of rise in populace, the far right, um, and uh, sort of as a challenge to, to many of the things that we've been talking about. Well, I think you know, it's, it's, we've already mentioned to some extent that it is an obvious challenge when you begin to have mobilization against, if not the welfare state or the, or the existing state per se, certainly against some of the benefits that are being provided to those who are somehow different from, you know, those who are in, considered within the, within the nation. And you know, clearly it's not been as toxic in Scandinavia as it has been in other parts of the world, but it still undermines the system and begins to raise questions to the system. And I think as Christian was talking about, to some extent, the shift of, of, of the Progress Party and the Danish People's Party from simply being anti-tax and to some extent anti-systemic toward being anti-immigrant, you know, really, really begins to explain, you know, or is a part of this and raising these fundamental questions about who is who is a Dane or who is suitable to be a member of the Danish society and who should be getting the benefits of being in that society, just as it is in many other places. Mm -hmm. But again, not nearly so toxic, fortunately. Mm -hmm. Though, though, as we know, these parties are over, you know, in recent years, attracting more and more individuals with that, you know, that type of rhetoric um, and that um, is, are seeing more support, obviously, variations across across the countries. And there are, um, you know, ebbs and flows, uh, you know, between who's going, um, but that much of what's attracting um, individuals to these parties is exactly that, right? These questions that we're seeing everywhere, not just particular, of course, to this region of who is and who isn't fill in the blank and who should and who shouldn't be receiving right. certain certain benefits. And so- 
but I think it's important you know, that in many of these cases, you know, uh, that the, the populist parties tend to be very strong welfare nationalists. That is, mm -hmm. they often argue for stronger benefits and stronger uh, uh, wage, uh, wage benefits for the right people. Mm -hmm. So they're not like a, a lot like some populists who are being anti-systemic, anti-welfare, period. Mm -hmm. But they're much more targeted in terms of who, what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Right, and very much, you know, sort of defining who is and who isn't part of the yep. nation, and those that, that who are part of of the nation sh should receive those exactly. Right. And so that I think, you know, thank you. No, that's that is a very important distinction between the the populist parties in Scandinavia in the Nordic countries compared to those, and even the the, the conservative parties that we see um, in, in different yep. different areas. Um, I think that's that's very important. Um, I want to, yeah, Christian, do you have your I just want to support that idea because I think it's very important to, to especially from a U.S. perspective, to think of this as, as this is happening in a small multi-party system, which is, creates a different logic. Because in the two-party systems, those who, who, who don't like the migrants, then they vote for the Republicans. <laughs> this is not the case in, in, in the Nordic countries, mm -hmm. at least as from a Danish perspective. This party has specialized in not liking migrants, but still do liking the welfare state for the right, right. people, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this very special combination. Combination. So it's not really a threat to the overall idea of, about having a large and expanded welfare state with healthcare, elderly care, all this kind of stuff. Actually, they, they see themselves as protecting this. Mm -hmm. So another interpretation is that it is actually pretty difficult to have a right-wing coalition in the Nordic countries nowadays without uh, these national welfare guards around so to some extent, the big story about having a, a, a big welfare state is somehow consolidated by these parties, one okay. could say, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Finland is the one exception, but the true Finns, which is still more right wing, but, but at least for, for Sweden and Denmark and, and partly for Norway, it's, it's, it is a fragmented uh, um, a right wing that really have little challenge uh, to the idea of having a, 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 a broad welfare state. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's another perspective, but then you can have all kind of, there's also for me, just there's a feedback loop in as Greta was, was talking about that the, the, you, they need to develop these systems and, uh, and they need to adapt. And to some extent, this is uh, letting the heat off the kettle. I would say that, that there are real problems uh, with migrations that we have talked about, something about the skills levels. There are also other stuff that we can talk about later. And to some extent, it needs to be argued and it needs to go into the system in order to be handled. Uh, and for me, sort of over a longer run, maybe it hasn't been that bad <laughs> to have had this discussion. But, but mm -hmm. I, maybe that might be a very controversial point of view. Maybe it's very political science point of view that, okay, whoever's get elected, get them into the system and then let them talk and it will be good in the long run. But mm -hmm. you might also have this effect. Mm -hmm. No, I think yeah. that's a real... Yeah. Go ahead. I was, just, uh, I was just going to agree. I think it may be good to try to domesticate uh, these wild animals. Uh, <laughs> and, and really bring them into the discussion rather than excluding them, because I think too often they've been excluded and, and they benefit from being excluded off. Greta? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that, that, that's uh, illustrated quite uh, clearly within Scandinavia also, where, where the, the Swedish uh, non-populist parties or whatever you would call them, they have tried to exclude the, the Swedish Democrats. Uh, and that has uh, contributed to a, a, an extensive boost in their following. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in, in Norway uh, and also in Denmark, even more so in Denmark now, in fact, uh, the, the, um, <coughs> the, the, the populist right uh, parties, the, the progress parties, they have been co-opted much more than what has been the case in, 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 in Sweden. Uh, and um, in Norway, they have even been in, in government uh, for, for quite some years. Uh, this party left the government now in January this year, but until then they had been uh, part of the conservative government for, for um, uh, five years. And uh, that has disciplined this, this party to a very large uh, extent. So today they are, um, they are, are uh, more similar to, to the, the mainstream parties than, than what they used to be. And, and, and they have sort of um, channeled 
many of these these currents into democratic uh, institutions, mm -hmm. which I, I believe in many ways has been um, a better strategy, if one can call it a strategy, um, from the, the, the other parties' point of view, as compared to, to what has happened in Sweden. But Finland, uh, Frank, is, is interesting when it comes to exactly this issue, also because of the true Finns. Yeah, it was like, so the true Finns, like, that, that has been a big discussion within Finland as well, that should the other party, parties exclude the true Finns, or to, should they take them as part of the government? Because as part of the government, many people believe that they would lose their popularity. So they were like actually part of the last government for four years. But what happened, that, that was like quite a this strange thing that within the true Finns party, there was this like this internal coup, coup during this time, which meant that, you know, those people who stayed in the government and then the like the new true Finns, they, they split into two different parties. So basically the, the party split into two parties during their time in the government. And then when the next elections came, then the, the part of the, or the part, part of the true, true Finns, which remained as part of the government, they didn't get basically almost any votes. And all the votes went to the part of the, the part of the party, which like split from, from it to become this new like opposition party. So in a way they were able to like eat their cake and still have it by being part of the government, but still like having this new party, which like which benefited from this being part of the opposition, even though at the same time, part of the, like one part of the party was still part of the government. So that, that was kind of the split that happened. But, and it, and it turned out that the people who were not part of the government anymore, they were the ones who got, that, that, who got all the votes afterwards that previously went to the true Finns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's an interesting strategy. I mean, that was not the, the intent of that strategy, but the fact of having the split in the party, it actually, as you said, Frank, benefited them because, you know, we know that parties often when they, you know, smaller parties, this is a lot of my own research um, that has shown this, that smaller parties, it, parties like the populist parties that when they join in a government, as we've all said, this legit, as you've all said, this legitimizes them, this gives, you know, normalizes many of these sorts of positions. It's easier perhaps also to kind of regulate from within because they're part of coalitions and they have to moderate. But the flip side of that is that that can actually hurt them come election time because their true support, their supporters, exactly, and this is exactly what's happened in Finland, is that their supporters, exactly, well, it was kind of like stroke of genius, even though I think that they didn't do it like intentionally, but, but it was kind of like stroke of genius that they were able to influence the government by being part of that, but still like then splitting the party and having this new party, being able to criticize the government at the same time, that led them like that they didn't lose their popularity in the next mm -hmm. election, they otherwise would have. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so it was an unintended, you know, consequence of what they did. Although that was obviously not, not, yeah. not, not exactly the intention. Um, I want to shift gears a bit um, and actually um, turn to you, Frank, and give you a chance to talk a bit about um, um, your research, which is, of course, um, related to much of what we've been talking about, although um, from from a different perspective, focusing on this idea of happiness um, and the, the idea that we uh, find that. Scandinavians, Finns especially, are, are very happy according to um, sort of international international polls. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about what we mean by happiness and then to kind of connect this to some of the, the, the things that we've been talking about in terms of what this Nordic model, this Nordic idea is. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, I think it was three years ago that this word happiness report has been like published since I think 2012 and Almost every year, some some scan, some Nordic country has been like the number, the happiest country in the world. That Norway has been like one time the happiest country. I think Denmark has been three times, and now Finland has been the happiest country three times in a row. I think like only non-Nordic country that has been like the number one was Switzerland one year. And when Finland was like, when when like when Finland got this like nomination as being the happiest country in the world, I think the Finnish people were like quite surprised and like you know quite like skeptical about the whole study that says that, yeah, no, no. Because I think the Finnish self image is kind of that we are kind of like this silent and melancholic people who like to listen to sad music and, you know, and so <laughs> it's not part of our self image that we are this particularly happy bunch of people. So the Finnish people were like, and like, that was like the, re the first reaction was that there must be something wrong with the study. <laughs> like, like the, one key, key thing to know about the study that actually the question that they use, it's, it's come from this like Gallup World Poll, which is like 
done in, I think, like 160 countries or something like that nowadays. And they ask the same question in every country, like from a national representative sample. And the question is that, think about your life where zero is the worst possible life and 10 is the best possible life. Where would you put yourself on this scale from like zero to 10? And if you think about that question, it's, it's not the question that, you know, have you been laughing today or are, are you like, you know, do you experience joy or anything like that? But it's more this kind of like satisfa quiet satisfaction with your life that are you like satisfied with the living conditions that you have? And when there had been like some studies about, you know, asking more directly these joy and smiling related questions, in those studies, the Finland is not, not the happiest country in the world. And in those kind of studies, the, the Central American countries tend to do like really good. You know, that the countries like Nicaragua and Costa Rica tend to be like the happiest in the world. But when it comes to like the satisfaction with the life condition, with this question is asking, then it seems that the Nordic model seems to be able to produ produce more satisfaction on average than, than the other countries. And I guess it's quite much about, you know, that it's not that there will be like more people who will like evaluate them, their, their lives as 10 in the Nordic countries, but it's more that, you know, that there's like less people who evaluate their lives really low, that the welfare system is able to make sure that you know, there's not many people who think, think about their life as being like very low on this scale. So like, it's kind of like the, kind of like this, people's answers are more narrowly around the center rather than that there be like this part of the population who are like very, who don't like evaluate their life as highly satisfied. So that's kind of like, I guess, like the short answer to why, why, why the Nordic countries are like doing so well that it's, it's not about like joy or anything like that, but it's more about this satisfaction with the life conditions. And when we look at the factors that tend to predict like national levels of like high levels of national life satisfaction, then this welfare system is one that having like these extensive benefits makes people like, you know, the, the people who are less well off, they, they do better in these kind of countries. And also actually this, this sense of trust is a big issue here as well. That, that trust is one of the things that, you know, that, that seems to be predicting which countries do better on the on this thing thing? So I was like in, investigating this. Like after Finland, Finland got, got was nominated the happiest country in the world. I've, I've been like asked this question many times that why is Finland so happy? So I've been like investigating it quite much with few colleagues, and we wrote for this like World Happiness Report. This one like like chapter on the topic, and we were talking about that there's, there seemed to be like this kind of like some kind of like virtuous cycle in the Finnish or in the Nordic societies. And it starts with like this high trust, that there's high trust in the institution and each other, which means that, you know, that in these countries, people are also willing to vote because, because people trust the institutions, they're willing to vote for parties who are like, kind of like wanting to preserve the institutions. So like the Nordic countries are the, one of the few countries where you, you can like go to the election as a politician, say, say that I'm going to raise taxes, more taxes to the people, and you can win the election like with that kind of agenda. Because like people are trusting that the money that they are giving in taxes, it, it goes to the good causes, that they, they get something for the money that, you know, the, well, the healthcare system or the educate, free education system and so forth. So that's kind of like that the trust in institution leads to people to vote for parties which like preserve these institutions, which means that the institutions are functioning well and giving people more things. And because of that, people get like more benefits and more security from the, from the government. And because of that, their like trust in the government like increases it increases even more. So there's, there's kind of like this virtuous cycle working in the Nordic countries between the trust and the trust in institutions, instance institutions providing for the citizens and then citizens feeling that they benefit from the institutions. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. Actually, I want to come to a, a question that uh, someone posed a, a little while ago, which was um, if the high trust in government that you've just talked about results from governments being trustworthy or if there's other sources or explanations of that. And you've just touched on, you know, sort of this idea of why people are willing, you know, to vote for parties that are, you know, that are, you know, pushing for higher taxes because of what that money is going for, et cetera. But I wonder if this idea of trustworthiness um, is part of that as well, or if there are others, uh, other things in that. Yeah, I guess like, of course, like in, in when there's like some indexes on corruption and so forth, as you mentioned, they're like the fin Finland and other Nordic countries tend to be like, one of the countries with like the lowest levels of corruption, which means that the government institutions are seen quite, as quite trustworthy. That is, that like this Bo Rothstein, who was this like the Swedish researcher on the topic, he said that he said that you know the Nordic countries seem to be like having this kind of like this high trust, high trust like you know, high trust model where like where people 
where the, like the norms of trust are very high and people that the corruption is low and because of that the people who are in the government they know that you know the gov that that they know that nobody is expecting any like you know corruption from them but then then in some other countries they have like this more this low trust equilibrium if you go to a country like Russia people don't want to pay taxes because they know that the other people are avoiding taxes around them and they know that many much of the money that they give the taxes is going to be like you know it's going to go to somebody's pocket so that's going to there's going to be corruption and if you're if you're the official within the within in the country that you're 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 like friends and your family are expecting you to like extract money from the system because that's what everybody else is also doing so they have like this like this low trust equilibrium where everybody is expecting the government to like you know or everybody trying to benefit from the government while the nordic countries have this like this high trust equilibrium where people know that other people are not like trying to try to extract anything from the system because of that they don't themselves try to do it as well. Mm -hmm. Also, I think you know, another important thing that goes along with that too is the relatively high levels of transparency. So that the systems, you can, you can you have a better chance as a citizen to know what's actually going on. And, there, and that which also in turn reduces corruption and enhances trust. So having built high, very transparent systems also, I think really again, it's a part of that virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. So I want to ask. We have another question that some, someone posed a, a while ago, and Frank or or Guy or whomever um, would like to, to to answer this. This actually is in relation to a comment that Guy you made at the beginning, which is that um, that trust in governments, although obviously still high, is declining, um, and that we um, in in. In, in some of the countries in the region. Um, and the question is if this is, if you think this is related to Euroscepticism and as the countries have become more integrated in the European Union, if this idea of that trust in government is connected not only with national government, but with, uh, with the European Union, the European Union institutions as well. Um, and if that has perhaps led to while still high levels of trust in comparison to the US or other countries, <coughs> Um, we're, we're seeing that decline within, within these countries themselves. Okay, I'll take a shot at it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't see much of it actually personally having to do with Euroscepticism. I'm sure that's part of the, I think, you know, it, in, in part, it's, you know, some of it's simply a zeitgeist, I think, in the world. that trust everywhere has been going down, not just in Scandinavia. I mean, fortunately, Scandinavia and Nordic countries will be getting with very high levels. And secondly, you know, governments, for the most part, have, have been facing a number of shocks to, in terms of their capacity to produce. I mean, with the, the, the Great Recession and immigration as, as a major policy challenge, aging populations, et cetera, and the need, need to, to fund those programs. So governments, I think, in, have been facing a number of really important challenges which may make people think, you know, that they're essentially they're not ca as capable as they once might have been. But a lot of it, I think, is sort of a general international spread of skepticism about government. A lot, and to some extent, I think it's my friend Jan Pierre in Sweden argues that the sort of general individu individuation and, and bourgeoisie of the population. So that perhaps they're not bowling alone so much. Uh, but they're certainly bowling in smaller numbers than perhaps than they used to be. <laughs> you have to use Putnam's phrases. That, that, no, that, that, no, that's good. So any, Frank, do you have any thoughts on, on this at all? Um, yeah, just like, I, I'm not sure about the, has the trust in Finland going down? I, I, I'm not like, I know that at least I don't remember seeing like numbers like going, going too much down. So I, I don't have an explanation for the, why it would have gone down because I'm not, I haven't. Mm -hmm noticed that it would have gone down at least in Finland. I'm not, I'm not sure about other Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. But I guess like, of course, like the media environment might be like one thing that, you know, that, that I guess like it seems to be that the one thing that drives these populist parties is quite much through this, like the new social media and kind of like, that the me media, which is like quite skeptical towards the government and like, and like, and more removed from like trying to de deliver any facts to the people. Like, and, like the, and, and I guess like that's plays quite a big role in the U US as well. That why, why trust in government is so low is partly because like also that there, there's like the media takes advantage of like that if the people want to read this we people are more prone to read this like new bad news than the good news about the government 
because of that, you know, to catch what people are delivered through through the media. And I guess like so that 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 might be like one one part of the dynamic why the trusting government has gone down has, is is through the it's it's because of like what what media what kind of story stories media and like social media are telling people about the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess that also like plays a big role, like pro probably in the immigration. Why why these populist parties have like so much talk, talk so much about the immigration because it, it seems that you know that the, how how popular the populist parties are in different European countries basically doesn't have like much to do with how many immigrants there are within the certain country. Like some countries have a much higher levels of immig immigration, some countries have much much lower levels of immigration. But the populist parties, like the, the how how much big share of the votes they get, doesn't like have much to do with that. For example, Estonia, like which is like which has like one of the lowest levels of immigrants in the whole Europe, that they they have like very low levels. Like I think like Finland has like much much less immigrants than Sweden, and like Estonia has like one tenth of the immigrate immigrants per capita than Finland. But still, like they, they even they have like this quite quite a popular right wing party, which is like against immigration. So like it's it it, it the pop, 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 kind of like the Populism of the it is, it, parties which are against immigration don't have like much to do with like how many how many problems there are actually with the immigration, but more that you know that whatever small things happen, they're like you no know, pumped up in the social media and in in their own bubbles. Everything seems to be about immigration, even even though, for example, in Finland, it seems that that the places where there's a more immigrant, most immigrants are the places where the immigrant like this right wing party has the less less vote share, smallest share of votes. So. Helsinki and the capital area, where is where the most of the immigrants Im Im are, immigrants are living, and in, in the Helsinki and the capital area, the Krupins have like the smallest share of votes, while they have like very big share of votes in many country countryside locations, which actually don't have basically almost any immigrants in in there. So it's like it seems to be much more about like what the media playing up these things and social media playing up these things than what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Um, so I want to um, uh, aware of the time, and we have several several things that I want to make sure we we, we touch on. Um, but real quickly, we have a question that's come in um, about unionization, um, and that's something that obviously we've always been able to identify it with um, Scandinavia, with, which is high levels of union membership, which hasn't um, um, we haven't really touched on yet. Um, and the question is about declining levels of unionization or union membership. Um, and if uh, we could speak a bit about the sources of this and what the possible impacts of, of this may be as well. Um, so whomever would like to jump in on, on, on that. Christian, do you want to try? I can start, but I'm, I'm not an expert, but they have declined uh, also in Denmark, also in Sweden, also in Norway, but, but it's, it's a little bit difficult to to, but it's still at a very at a very high level. So it's a little bit. It is somehow very important to the institutional structure of the system that people they are unionized. No no doubt about it. But it's very difficult to find sort of the tipping point. about how 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 low should it go before you have a problem? <laughs> and you can, for instance, look at the difference between Denmark and Norway. So Norway they don't have the GEN system, which means they have a lower level of unionization, but you still have more or less the same labor market. So it's, 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 it's very difficult to tell, but it is, it is true that you start to have sectors which is less sheltered uh, by minimum wages, especially with, with many migrants in them, cleaning in Denmark, for instance, in hotels in Denmark. So, so you do have to have unregulated uh, sectors and uh, they do put maybe a pressure on the system to some extent, but, but, but then they tend to specialize that small, migration shelter sectors that natives don't really get into but so it's a little bit okay they create this kind of uh living condition that is not usual in in a nordic context and it might be difficult actually to earn a living because it's also difficult to live here so uh, to, to some extent it is problematic but i'm not really sure yet that it is systemic uh, as a, a systemic problem that it's, it's, it's going down, but it is going down and it, it has to do also with the kind of jobs. It's, it's not only about people, they don't want to go into unions anymore. It's also about that you have a change in the employment structure. So you have less industrialized jobs which are with their unionization was the strongest. And so when, and when that's changed into the service sector, lower and upper service sector, then they are less unionized. So that, this is at least for Denmark, a, a lot of the explanation for it. 
So that was a non-answer. <laughs> <But, laughs> yeah. right, one of the key reasons that you know, those industries which tend to tend to be highly unionized are the industries which like which are like less and less important, and, and there's more and more people in in those service sectors and places where people have tended to tended to be like less unionized. So probably the, the unionization level within certain industry might have not changed so much, but it's just that the, the labor market has changed changed towards those industries or to those like services which are like which tend to be like less unionized. Mm -hmm. Um, no, thank you. I think that both, both, both good perspectives, even though you're, neither of you are experts on this, but I do think, Christian, to, to the point you made, which has come up a couple of times, which is to say we may be seeing changes, in this case, in unionization levels um, from the past, but we still, across the region, but if we take the region as a whole, and we take the Nordic countries as a whole, that we still do have high levels of, of unionization. And I think we've been sort of talking about this when we talk about if we do see declining levels of trust, for example, where we may be seeing that we're already starting at a very high level and that we might be seeing changes there, but that still as a whole, we're seeing a very high levels in this case of unionization or trust. And when we compare to continental Europe, of course, the US um, and elsewhere. So I think that that distinction, which has come up several times, I think is, is an important one. Greta, did you wanna? Yeah, uh, I, I would like to emphasize this more strongly, the, the, the question of uh, unionization. I mean, organized labor is a backbone of the Scandinavian uh, labor market welfare state system. It, is, it, it still is, even though it's in decline. And it's, it's more in decline in Norway, actually, as compared to Sweden and Denmark. Mm, it used to be uh, more or less on the same very, very high level in, in all these uh, three countries, Finland, I'm not uh, familiarized with in, in the, this respect. Uh, and, and Sweden and, and Denmark managed to keep up the level uh, more effectively than what was the case in Norway because uh, unemployment fees, uh, unemployment uh, transfers were, uh, were um, connected to membership in unions. So this was an uh, institutionally very, very important grip on, on uh, the labor force. This is changing now. It has changed over the, the last years with an important impact on the level of unionization. We have not had the same system in Norway. So we have had a lower uh, in degree of unionization for, for many years. Um, and now, of course, it, it's a question of which uh, branches you're talking about, because in Norway, as I said earlier, we have had this uh, very, very strong component of, of um, labor immigration uh, because of the, the strong oil economy and the strong uh, demand in, in, uh, in the system since the, the turn of the century in particular. And, and consequently, uh, we have uh, over the years now got um, sectors of the economy that has become um, uh, East European uh, sectors. It's 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 called that. You know, I mean, the Polish, the Polish, uh, the, they have the Polish plumbers in in the UK, in Norway, the the, the Polish construction workers, and and um, there has been a, a, a almost a complete takeover uh, of the the construction um, economy by this uh, this EU labor over the years, which has had a strong impact on the salary level, even, even though we have a, a, a regulated, to a large extent, labor market. Nevertheless, I mean, the, the, the pay is, is, is lower than, than what, what used to be the, the case for, for native workers. So this, you have had this sort of a dynamic um, similar to social dumping kind of, uh, kind of um, uh, mechanisms. And, and this is, is, um, is of great concern to, to particularly labor politicians and, and um, um, they're now increasingly using a, a sort of um, a, a law, a, a part of the law to uh, generalize agreements, to try to, to keep up the high uh, floor, the wage floor, in, in, uh, even in these sectors, and they're trying to recruit um, uh, labor migrants into the unions, but they have not been very successful so far. But this this is a a, a huge challenge to the the, um, the whole system on, on a long term basis, definitely. 
Great, thank you. Um, so there, I have sort of two topics I'd like to, to, to make sure we get to at least briefly. I realize we don't have a lot of time, but um, Christian, I would like to talk a little bit about um, something we haven't talked about, which is social cohesion. Um, and obviously I'm giving you this and saying, don't spend a lot of time, which of course it's a huge topic and much of your research, but um, I would be remiss if we didn't um, talk about it a bit and how this connects to many of the things that we've been talking about um, relating to immigration, changing societies, the Nordic model, all of these kinds of things. So um, I'll throw it over to you to, um, to, to at least talk a bit about um, this, this idea. So I think we, we talked a lot about the trust in, in, in institutions and all mm -hmm. of the dynamics around that. But I also think I he introduced it by saying there was some kind of trust between citizens actually mm -hmm. around <laughs> that, that might matter even more. That, that before you start to build institutions together, if you don't uh, trust each other, then it might be difficult. So this is like, so it might be some kind of basic foundations. So we have an interest in measuring these trust levels among humans, right? And, and I think one of the, yeah, I published a lot on that. And if you ask me, we know it's very high. Uh, we are sort of also world champions on uh, not, not even challenged by Switzerland on in terms of having trust in each other. If we ask people, do you think most people can be trusted or you can never be too careful? Some 80% or 76% of, of Danes would say you can trust most people. So we do think that there's something about it, that people that go around having a rule of thumb saying that in general, I can, I can trust most people. So, so and, it, 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 and it, it might be very important for the functioning of, of the system, you know, because if other people also pay their taxes, then I'll, I'll be willing to pay mine before I, I, before I, I trust that they paid, paid their taxes. As, uh, as, as Frank was saying, also in terms of happiness, we know that if people think that they can trust other people, then they tend to be more happy because it's a basic feeling of, uh, of security. So there are these many, 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 many sides effects that could go together with trust. And, but the, the big puzzle is where does it come from? <laughs> and, and I think that we have a, a, a bunch of theories around. There's uh, the, the Robert Putnam boring theory. It's about civil society being very uh, extensive. I, I, I don't believe that so much, but, but we do have in Nordic countries a big uh, civil society, many associations, so that might be one explanation. The other one is more like Bo Rostein. He's also been mentioned a couple of times. I'm a big fan of Bo. You should, maybe you should have invited Bo, but, but he would say it's all about state institutions being fair, non-corrupt, and then you can you, uh, maybe also universalism can develop this kind of trust. And if I, end, if I should make a small contribution, I would say there's something about economic equality. And then we don't know really what is it about economic equality. It, it goes together, but it's difficult to find sort of the mechanism through which this should have an impact. And, and I think I have like two explanations. One is that it is about that in more equal societies, most people tend to think of most other peoples as middle class. And there's a lot of evidence that people, they tend to trust middle classes. <laughs> so this is one mechanism at least. And the other one is that in more equal societies, you get rid of, of severe poverty. And we also know that those who really feel uh, you are you, people, they are fear of gangs and uh, underclass uh, people. And if you can avoid that, then you also have solved some of the problem. So for me, that's part of the solution. So it's about uh, economic inequality. Also, it's also about reduced poverty. And I think that is also about, so what could be a threat to the system when that could be increased inequality? And it could be these uh, tendencies of poverty. And we start to have these mechanisms, which also goes together with lower trust in the US that we have uh, yeah, in, in the Nordic countries. And to some extent, it is important by migration, <laughs> which is uh, part of the game. And, but I also think that the Nordic country, they are, we are uniquely position to fight that phenomena because we have done it before and we have state, state's capacity. We have a lot of things that can make us much more capable of fighting this thing. But I think it is there. Uh, yeah, that was a long answer, but no, 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 I saw no. a, 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 a mark by Guy. Yes. Uh, anyone else want to? I just, I would just yeah. want to ask Christian about chickens and eggs. That is, <laughs> uh, I mean, do you, do you, build the interpersonal trust by having first equality, or would you build equality by first having interpersonal trust? 
Yeah, that's difficult. <laughs> I, 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 I would take the easy solution. It's, 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 it's a two-way street, right? That uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's probably much easier. To, for, for me, you build, you, for, okay, for me, the, 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 the historical <clears throat> development goes like that, that you, you, you developed fairly equal societies. And after that, you created uh, pretty high trust levels. And I think it, also, it goes together with measurement that we know that the Nordic countries, they turned high trust is. So in Denmark, the first measurement was from 79 and there was about half. So 49% said that most people can be trusted. And now it is the 80%. So it's not about we are always being Vikings or we always had traded or something like that. But it, it is somehow for me built into the Nordic model that it came first and then we had these trust levels coming around. And then we get this kind of of uh, virtuous circles that I agree with, uh, with, with, with Frank and others. Mm -hmm. So for me, but it's also because I'm more into this institutional about the, you know, the, the positive effects of universalism. It, 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 for me, it's something that Danes have, have not always trusted other Danes. It, it's not, it's not a, uh, they are basic for not having extremely low levels like in Southern Italy or in, in sub-Saharan places, but but this extreme high level we see now, for me, uh, this is something generated uh, by institutions, uh, not something that the institution was built on. Mm -hmm. Greta. Yeah, no, no I, I fully support uh, that uh, way of interpreting the chicken and egg uh, dichotomy. <laughs> uh, and and there, there have been uh, new historical investigations uh, in, in Norway um, revealing that, uh, I mean, the, the equality level was very low in in Norway actually at the turn of the, the, the last century um, and and uh, so it, it, it's more likely that you have the direction of the the, the arrow uh, according to what Christian is saying than the other way around mm -hmm. but but of course the most important thing here is the uh, mutually reinforcing uh, mechanisms that that uh, take place when you have set the whole thing in in, in motion Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I want to conclude on something that I, none of you are exactly experts on, but something, that, <laughs> um, but something that I think is on, on of course, everyone's minds, um, which is um, the uh, Scandinavian Nordic countries' response to the coronavirus, um, as well as how citizens are responding to not only the crisis but responding to what they're being instructed by their governments. Um, and Sweden especially has gotten quite a lot of um, international, you know, the international media has been very interested in, in what's been going on in Sweden. But I think more generally, um, there's some interesting things to, to, to observe across, across the region. Um, and I just wonder, perhaps we could go around um, to, to conclude since we're getting towards the end of, of, of our time here, it, to give your thoughts on how you think many of the things that we've talked about in terms of social trust and cohesion and the Nordic model more generally has played a role both in what the policies that are coming from, from the respective governments, but also the response to these policies and, and, and um, that we're seeing um, across, across societies uh, in, in the region. Um, so who would like to? <laughs> I, can, I can start. Sure. So in the early, early, early this year, like in the, in the March, I participated, participated in this one round table about, you know, the as regard to ha happiness of different nations. And, but then, then of course the COVID-19 COVID was the, just like arriving to the Europe and to the US like more that the societies were not like so close than any, anything at that point. But we were like already seeing that it's gonna be happening, that there, it's gonna be a big thing, this thing. So even though that was not part of the topic, but then we ended up also talking about that. And what, what quite many people there were saying was that probably those countries which have like this high levels of trust we are going to be like surviving better than those countries which have like lower levels of trust in, into the government, because like to because quite many of the things that like when people have to be doing now are dependent on them trusting the government and wanting to do what the government what government wants them to do like voluntarily, because you cannot like you know you cannot like control all the people all the people's movement you cannot control how many people they're seeing you can like you know you can close the bars but you can you cannot like make sure that people don't have this private parties and so forth. So because of that, quite many people there, like quite many experts there were like agreeing that the trust is going to be a trust in government is going to be a big, big role here. And actually I've seen already like a couple of studies coming out after that, that have like shown that the, when one has like look, looked at like these levels of trust in government, and then one has like look at like how many people have died in different countries. 
due to this like this virus it, it has, there has been like some connection there that the higher trust countries have like tended to have lower numbers of covid-19 related deaths so that, that i think that the trust is a big issue even even like in, in the response of this crisis mm -hmm. thank you guy oh thank you jj no i i i I agree with I agree very much with what Frank had to say. I mean, I think it's distrust both with in government, but also in, in one another. You know, whether individuals are willing to take personal responsibility for you know wearing their masks, distancing, and so forth. Uh, so if you assume that your neighbor is a responsible person as well as yourself, again, you, you tend to get better results. So I think, again, the Scandinavian model seems to be somehow perfectly suited for dealing with a, with a pandemic, as, as well as other things. Mm -hmm. So I would very much subscribe to what Frank had to say. Great, thank you. Greta. Yes, but uh, <laughs> I, I think basically this is, this is correct. But, and, and in the Norwegian context, trust has been a, a big thing. In, in the the COVID uh, governance, uh, uh, generally speaking, and and it has been an exposure of trust with capital letters. I mean the the health authorities, the government, and 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 other uh, those two are of course most important, but also the interpersonal trust thing has been very very um, important and and visible and been highlighted etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, sweden is, is is such an interesting uh, outlier in in the scandinavian situation and and for once i mean they have been the less fair country uh, and and sweden is usually the the the, the governance loving uh, cousin in in the the scandinavian uh, setting and, and being extremely keen on, on governing uh, even people's uh, private lives to a larger extent than what we have had in both Denmark and, and, and Norway. But in this context, they, they had, uh, had this, I mean, maybe over-exaggerated trust uh, in, in the people and that the people would just behave the way they should in a uh, extraordinary situation like uh, the, the COVID-19. Uh, and and uh, this hasn't happened. And, and Sweden has been a, a um, disaster in so many ways as compared to both Denmark and Norway in, in the, this, uh, this um, case. Uh, and with lack of governance uh, is, is uh, really, I mean, it can be exaggerated also, but I mean, uh, definitely as compared to Denmark and Norway, um, uh, meager governance is, is what has, has characterized uh, Sweden, and they have had uh, 10 times, times as many uh, deaths uh, as compared to Norway. Yeah, but I guess that Sweden seems to be like the only country almost in the world that has chose a different strategy than every, every other country, that all the other countries chose, that, hey, let's like try to prevent the COVID-19 from spreading, so let's practice social distancing and so mm -hmm. forth. And Sweden was the only country who said that, no, no, let's not do that. So like you know, that, that, they're, that they're the outlier in many ways because they're the only country who chose a different strategy to combat this virus compared to all the other countries. So because, because of that, this trust issue and other things might not be like the thing that, that mm -hmm. we have to exclude Sweden from the analysis because they didn't try to do the same thing as what the other countries were trying to do. Mm -hmm. No, very good point. Christian. Yeah, I just want to, I, I wanted to say what Frank is saying. Uh, I took, so to, for me, to some extent, Sweden is simply a, it's a matter of policy failure from a central uh, government uh, civil servant level in, in, in my point of view, actually. So, so I think it's come and therefore it might not always be good to trust the government so much. <laughs> That's also part of the trust literature. You <laughs> might have some doubts uh, that might also be good, uh, a good feedback to the system. And, and maybe they have had too much, but then I'll just add one thing to, to what the rest of uh, have, have said that is, when then you decide to do something about it, then I totally agree with, with Guy and Frank that this is, 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 is to some extent just a collective action problem. And, and then Scandinavian countries, they're really good at solving this situation where everybody's better off 
if they do that, I don't do it. And we have all kind of way of dealing with that, partly because we think we have solved it before. There's also these penalties in the local areas that, that you actually stigmatize people who don't follow the rules because we know that everybody else is doing it and this is how we do stuff. <laughs> and we have the same with garbage. Why we don't litter much in Scandinavia is because to some extent you're punished by your fellow citizens if you throw uh, things around in nature, right? Uh, but but so, so that is totally correct. But then just one last thing, and I thought Guy would say, but that is to some extent also state capacity. When they decide to do it, then there are some basic state capacities in line whereby you can do it. The state, the, the kind of test that they are doing in Denmark at the moment, at, uh, it's, it's like in two months, we test like four or 5% of the whole population, which is extremely high. And just to get this organized, uh, to get the, the results back in, it takes state capacity. It also takes very, very simple CPR numbers that you know who to send <laughs> these results to and, and do it uh, quickly. And uh, like in Germany, you have to put it on paper and then they missed a lot of the, the results because they could not find people. Because But when you have this trust in the state that I, I get all my information in there, they even have a personal citizen email. So I, they know that I'll get the things into the app again. It says something about state capacity in the Nordic countries. So when they start to work, they, they can actually do it. So maybe that's, uh, that's a real side to it as well, I would say. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Well, that's, I think, a good, a good note to end on. Um, and uh, thank you all for a really, really fascinating conversation. And I know we touched on lots of things and, of course, could have spent much more time on all of them. Um, but as always the case, I think we, we leave with, with more questions than we answer, which is not a bad thing. Um, but thank you all again. And thank you to everyone uh, who joined us. Um, in the audience. Um, and for those in the audience, um, my colleagues will be putting um, a link to a survey that we'd ask if you could just spend a few minutes um, after today's program to complete, um, and that will help us in uh, planning future programming. So with that, um, good afternoon uh, to everyone that is uh, in the US and uh, good evening to everyone that are my panelists that are uh, joining us from Europe and any of our audience members as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.